안녕하세요. 아, 저는 권율입니다. 아, 여러분을 아, 만나게 돼서 너무 아, 반갑습니다. 저는 아, 미국에서 태어나서 그 어려운 말을 한국말로 잘 아, 못합니다. <웃음> 그래서 한국말을 할지게 아, 조금 어린 아이 같아요. 아, 앞으로 어, 제가 공부를 열심히 해서 다음에는 어, 한국말로 하겠습니다. 네, 죄송하지만 오늘은 편하게 그, 어, 영어로 하게, 하, 하겠습니다. 어, 감사합니다. 땀 납니다. <웃음> Good evening. Um, my name is Kwon Yul. And it's an honor for me to be here with you tonight. And I want to thank all of you for giving me the opportunity to tell you a little bit about myself and why I've come to Korea. A few years ago, I had the good fortune of winning the American reality show Survivor. And since then, I've received many wonderful letters from people here in Korea. Some of them have been very gracious and thanked me uh, for increasing the profile of Korean Americans on television. Um, a number of them come from parents uh, who are asking for advice on how their children could get into good schools like Harvard or Stanford or Yale, or how they could get jobs working at places like Google and McKinsey. I've also gotten my share of unusual letters. Um, <laughs> for a while, I got uh, a number of letters um, <laughs> from people asking me to marry them. Uh, but what was interesting is that they all had the same handwriting. So I think they're all from the same people. And the handwriting was a little bit messy and kind of masculine. So I think <laughs> they're all written by a man. In any event, I'm incredibly thankful for all the support that I've received. And I've been moved by all the letters that I've read. But the ones that have uh, touched me the most are the ones from young Korean students, like many of you out here tonight. I've been incredibly inspired to hear from so many wonderful and thoughtful students who dream of a better future and have great ambitions. But at the same time, I've been hearing more and more stories from students like yourselves who are struggling. Many of them are overwhelmed with pressure from their schools and from their parents. Many are worried about their futures, and they're worried about disappointing their families if they're not successful. And some of them are experiencing deeper psychological and emotional problems, but they're too ashamed to tell anyone, and they feel trapped. Whenever I hear stories like these, my heart goes out to them, because it reminds me of how much I struggled in my youth. When people look at me today, they often look at my accomplishments and my resume, and they think that I've always been successful. They think that I've always been a natural leader. But what people don't know is that for many years, I struggled with psychological disorders that made it hard for me to have a normal life. And as they got worse, I became increasingly depressed, and at one point in my life, I considered ending my own life. Now, I didn't tell anyone and I didn't ask for help because I didn't think anyone would understand. And so I struggled by myself in silence. We still live in a society where emotional and psychological problems are not seen as medical problems, but they're seen as defects of character or weakness of spirit. There's a lack of awareness and understanding, and there's a stigma attached to mental illness so that people who need help don't ask for help and that families and friends of people who are in trouble don't understand them, they ignore the problem, they often criticize them and blame the victim. I think this is something that we have to change before more lives end in tragedy. So for the past couple of years, I've started doing something that I hadn't done before. I started speaking openly about my own problems. And I've written about my experiences in a book that's being published this week, called 나는 매일 재난한다. Now, in my case, there are probably many different reasons why I had the problems that I did. But certainly, the environment in which I grew up was one of them. 
When I was born in the United States in 1975, Koreans made up a tiny percent of the population, just 0.15 percent. And being part of such a small ethnic minority made it easy to be discriminated against. My mom tells me that when I was a young child, I was actually very talkative and outgoing. But once I started going to school, I changed. I became quiet and fearful and timid. Kids would make fun of me because my parents spoke Korean in public, and because my mom、uh, packed me lunches with all these strange foods like kimchi and kimbap. I also had a severe lisp when I was a child, which made it hard for people to understand me, and a lot of them thought that I had an accent. So I became afraid to speak up because I didn't want to get ridiculed and bullied. But staying silent didn't stop the bullying, and in fact, it made it worse. You know, kids would call me names like Chink and Chong, and they would make faces at me by slanting their eyes. But there was one incident, in particular, that had a devastating impact on me. When I was in elementary school one year, a lot of the bigger kids would pick on me and some of my friends. And what they would do is they would hide in the bathroom, and when we came in, they would beat us up, and then they would try to urinate on us. Even when these attacks stopped, I found that I was so scared that I couldn't go to the bathroom at school or anywhere where there were other people around. I would stand in front of the urinal trying to force myself to go to the bathroom, and I was just so scared I couldn't relax and I couldn't go. And because I couldn't use a bathroom in any public setting, I couldn't go to movies, I couldn't go to sporting events, I couldn't go shopping, I couldn't go to parties. I became a prisoner in my own home. And I missed out on so many of the experiences and memories that other normal children had. My lack of self-confidence also led to other problems. I started developing obsessive-compulsive disorder. So I started washing my hands 20 times a day until they became so dry that they would crack and bleed. I developed a form of social anxiety disorder where I would get so nervous around other people、uh, that I would start sweating uncontrollably, and this usually happened, especially around white people and around girls. And when I'm talking about sweating, I'm not just talking about a mild perspiration. I mean, I would literally perspire and drench my face and my clothes and just humiliate myself. And I can't tell you how embarrassing that was. So I stopped. Talking to people, I avoided people because I didn't want to humiliate myself in public. All these problems left me feeling profoundly depressed and isolated. And in retrospect, knowing what I know today, I realized I should have gotten help. But at the time, I just couldn't bear the thought that anyone would learn my secrets. You know, I, I knew that my parents loved me, but I thought that they just wouldn't understand. And I thought if I told them, that they would. Dismiss my concerns as figments of the imagination, or even worse, that they would blame me or be disappointed in me. So I struggled by myself in silence. I remember praying that as I got older, my problems would go away, but I found that they were getting worse. And eventually, my depression turned into despair, and I started thinking about killing myself. My slow. Emotional spiral downward might have continued if it wasn't for a tragedy that happened to my brother. One day, when I was in middle school, I came home and my brother had just gotten off the phone. And when I looked at him, his face was white. And I asked him, "What's wrong? What happened?" And he told me that one of his best friends, who had moved to a different part of the country earlier and who had trouble making new friends, had just committed suicide. Until then, I'd never had someone that I knew die, especially someone who was close to me, someone that I looked up, up to as a young. And in my grief and my shock, I remember thinking to myself, "How could this happen? How could someone who's so young and who had their whole lives ahead of them do something to end their own life?" And I realized I knew the answer. He could do it because he felt so alone and scared. And he had given up hope that things might get better. He could do it because、uh, he didn't like himself, and he couldn't imagine being anyone different. He could do it because he felt like I did. I saw then that I was heading down the same path, and I realized that I had to make a choice. 
I could do nothing, and I could continue down this road and become lonely and isolated my whole life, or until I decided, like my brother's friend did, that life just wasn't worth living anymore. Or I could make a choice. I could decide to change myself, to confront my fears, and to reach out to other people. Now, emotionally, you know, this this was a hard decision for me to make. Trying meant that I would have to push myself out of my comfort zone and and do the things that made me scared. Trying meant that I could fail. But where do you even start? Well, I thought about it, and I figured that if I'm trying to change myself, the first thing I have to do is figure out what I wanted to change. So I made a list of the long-term goals that I had for myself, the kind of person that I wanted to become, and the kind of skills and qualities that I would want to have. But even then, it became such a daunting, impossible task. I mean, there were so, thing, so many things about myself that I wanted to change. So I made it easier for myself. I told myself that I didn't have to change everything all at once. You know, I could take little baby steps. And so what I did was I broke up my long-term goals into smaller short-term goals that didn't seem so overwhelming and that I could do in small increments. Each day, for example, I made a checklist of all the things that I had to do, like raising my hand in class or saying hello to someone that I didn't know. I also realized that I couldn't just rely on my natural emotions to guide my behavior, but I knew that I was good at following rules. So I started creating rules for myself for how I would have to act in certain situations. For example, you know, I found that um, you know, one of the things that was very hard for me to do is to raise my hand in class. So I made a rule for myself that in the first 10 minutes of class, I had to raise my hand. And what I found was that by relying on these rules, I, it was a little bit easier to do things that I was normally too afraid to try. And by constantly pushing myself a little bit every day, I started making progress. You know, a lot of my earlier efforts weren't successful, and I had many frequent setbacks and failures. But I learned that failing at something isn't the end of the world. Life still goes on. And more importantly, I gave myself permission to fail. I told myself that what mattered was the process, not the outcome. And so I began to measure my progress by whether I tried, not whether the result itself was good or bad. And I also stopped comparing myself to other people. You know, I'd always had this. Uh, mindset where I look at other people and think, you know, they're so much smarter than I am. They're so much more articulate. They're so much more popular. I could never be like them. But once I started to benchmark my progress against my own goals rather than comparing myself to other people, I found that I didn't get as discouraged and that I was making more progress. And the other thing is that whenever I failed and、uh, felt that I was getting demotivated. I motivated myself by telling myself that if I never learned how to talk to girls, I'd never get married, and I would stay a virgin for the rest of my life. <laughs> and that scared me more than failing. What I learned is that if you try something over and over again, then it becomes less scary, less terrifying. And once you're able to do something successfully enough times, that starts building real confidence, and then you don't have to rely on these rules so much. And then you have this virtual cycle that develops, where success breeds confidence, and confidence breeds success. The other critical lesson I learned is that it's hard to change yourself by yourself, just using sheer willpower. You know, you can make a lot more progress if you get other people to help you. And the way you get other people to help you is by joining organizations and surrounding yourself with people who can support you and hold you accountable and provide you with a sense of community. So in my case, I joined a drama class and I signed up for a debate club and I started playing sports. And through these organizations, I started making real friends. The thing that I didn't do until I was much older was to start talking about my problems. Looking back, I wish I trusted my parents more. I wished I trusted my brother. I wish I'd spoken to a counselor or a mental health professional. What I didn't know is that there are resources available to help people discreetly and give them support, and where you can also find other people who are going through the same things. In closing, I just want to say that we all go through difficult times in our lives, and there are points where we all need help, and that, that's not something to be ashamed of. And when you do need help, there are people out there who will help you if you ask for it. 
If you don't know anyone that you can trust, then go to a counselor or a mental health professional who works at an organization whose job it is to help you, like the Korean uh, Association for Suicide Prevention or the Ministry of Health and Welfare. I believe that each of you deserves and has a right to be happy. Each of you has the power to change and to improve not just your life, but the lives of everyone around you. And whatever burdens you may be carrying, I want you to know that you're not alone, that things can and will get better, and that I'll be cheering for you. Thank you, and good luck.